Hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Color, and uh, I'm the uh, the interim associate director for international missions at Kent State University, and I'm here with uh, uh, Doctor, not Doctor, sorry, <laughs> Miss Debbie Runzer, who is our ESL director here at Kent State University. We're very happy to host a group of the ESL uh, English language learners here, or teachers, or students who are with us today. And the, the topic of today is the qualities of good English le language learners and presented by ESL Center of Kent State University. And just to, I'm going to repeat myself again. So in order to have the best quality of presentation, I might have to mute everybody during the presentation. But if you do have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask in questions. Or if you would rather type in the chat box, feel free to do that as well too. We're also going to have a Q&A session towards the end of the presentation. But if you do have questions during, we're welcoming you to jump in as well too. OK? OK. Cool things. Mm -hmm. So, short, quick introduction. My name is Color. So I work at Kent State for about uh, uh, seven years. I actually graduated from Kent State as well too. I'm working with Office of Global Education, particularly with uh, international missions. And uh, Dr. Debbie Ronzer is our ESL Center Director. She has over 20 years ESL teaching experience. She also has been teaching and uh, living in the overseas uh, to do English teaching job as well too. Yes, our center is International Tesla's Association is part of members over here. We will have introduction about Yes, our center later too. Thank you, Color. Um, again, welcome to everybody. I hope you're having a good day. Um, here it's a beautiful morning in Kent State, but I can imagine where you are. Maybe it is your afternoon or your evening. Wherever you are, hello and welcome. So as Color mentioned, today we're going to be talking about qualities of good language learners. So I'd like to start out by asking, um, what about your personal qualities? We know that every person is different. Are you shy or are you outgoing? Are you confident or more insecure? Do you like to work with other people or by yourself? Are you pessimistic? Are you typically optimistic? Are you self-aware? The reason I ask these questions is that we think it's important to know yourself for many different reasons in life, but particularly for language learning. Knowing yourself is important so that you can become a better language learner. Color, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. So we know that some people are more successful language learners than the average person. And why is that? And you might think it's hard work, it's intelligence, and certainly those are factors that can help. But research and scholars in the field of second language acquisition tell us that there are also characteristics or personality qualities that can help someone become a better language learner. So can you imagine what these characteristics or personality qualities might be? In this webinar, I'm going to rely on the framework of a TESOL scholar named H. Douglas Brown. Brown came up with um, 10 qualities through observation, through years of experience, that um, ESL teachers have found to be common among good language learners. For the purpose of this webinar, I've um, consolidated them into six. So we'll go through each one, one by one. We'll give you some examples. And hopefully as you're listening, you can think about yourself and see, are there ways in which you can tweak or make small changes in your approach and your attitude so that you can improve your style of language learning? So as I said, we're gonna go through six of these qualities of good language learners. The first one I'd like to talk about to you today is good language learners reduce their fear. So we know, or I think we know, my experience has been that learning a language can be a scary experience. 
So thinking about the first time you're in a real situation where you're using the language, lots of things can go right and lots of things can go wrong, right? People are afraid naturally of making mistakes. They're afraid of being embarrassed. And what happens when we're afraid? We tense up, we feel closed, we feel inward facing, and maybe we're even looking for an exit from the situation. And how about the opposite? What happens when you're unafraid? Do you feel open to new ideas, new information? Maybe you feel flexible? So if you think about this when it comes to language learning, which one is better? I think it's obvious that feeling less fear is better. So I think about in the ESL Center at Kent State, um, we ask students to uh, practice their writing through journal, um, journaling. So they write journals for us in class. And one time a student wrote in his journal about an experience he had at Walmart. So Walmart, as you may know, is a store in the United States with just about everything. And when you walk into the store, you might feel a little bit overwhelmed because there's so much everywhere. So the student decided to be brave and ask the store worker for help. He asked the store worker to help him find what he thought was the chocolate candy bar Snickers. And you see a picture of Snickers on the right. But instead of asking, where are the Snickers? He said, where are the sneakers? And you see a picture of the sneakers on the left, which are athletic shoes. So the store associate brought him to the part of the store where they sell shoes which obviously was the wrong place to be. But the student said that even though he felt embarrassed and wanted to say, that's okay, he repeated his question and found that he was mispronouncing the word and was able to find what he wanted. So this is just a simple example of how we can try our best to reduce our fear in social situations in order to open up and learn the language better. So I ask you to think about that. Are you able to reduce your fear in situations when you feel tensed up to relax and to be more open to the language learning? I totally agree with you, uh, Debbie, um, because myself, I also came through as an international student. I remember when I had my first uh, class, I was very nervous about uh, trying to raise my hand asking questions. And uh, uh, that kind of barrier had to slowly break through because my professor has been keep encouraging me to talk more in the class. And this is a common issue for a lot of our international students. You don't want to, just because you're worried about the, your language level, uh, you should not be holding yourself back from bringing the questions, be part of class discussion. Because one, those are important for your grades. Mm -hmm. Two, if you don't ask those questions, you are never able to get an answer. That's right. I was actually being told there's no stupid question. There's never stupid question. So there's something I would like to share as well, too. Excellent. Thank you, Color. So moving on to the second quality that we believe is important for good language learners, we believe that good language learners take risks and are comfortable with ambiguity. So I would ask you to ask yourself, are you a risk taker? Are you comfortable not knowing the answer for sure? Not being 100% correct? Ambiguity, that word means not being sure, uncertainty. So in our ESL program, again, I'd like to give you an example. Um, in our advanced classes for listening skills, we invite our students to go to an academic lecture in their major. And this can be a very intimidating experience for students um, because when they're sitting in the lecture, they might have the idea that they have to understand every word, that in order to understand a lecture, you must understand every word. And we know that that's A, not possible and not practical. So when students are able to relax and become comfortable with the parts that they don't know, focus on the key words and the ideas that they can understand, and make good guesses about the rest, they have a more beneficial experience in that kind of a situation. So students have to trust their instincts and be willing to make, uh, take risks. It's similar to what Color said, that if you have a question or a comment, um, it's risky to raise your hand and venture an answer. Maybe you will be wrong. 
Maybe you will need to repeat yourself. But the benefit of using the language, of feeling more self-confidence, we think is very important. So um, ambiguity, again, is the idea that I don't know for sure what the answer is. And for some people, this can be um, a very difficult um, feeling. Um, maybe they learned growing up in their home culture or in their school that the only time that you should answer a question is when you know for sure. But we would argue that in language learning, part of the mystery is you don't know. You don't know for sure what the word means, what the correct answer is, but the benefit is in using your instinct, guessing, and then even if you make a mistake, you'll learn from that mistake. So moving on to our third, um, our third quality of good language learners. Good language learners believe in themselves. So good language learners believe in themselves. And perhaps you're thinking to yourself, well, these are natural. But I think when we get into language learning situations, sometimes we have to remind ourselves of some of these practical ideas. So I have a picture on this slide of um, a little train, and in English we sometimes call a train an engine. So this little train, the story goes, when we were children we heard this story, that the train was at the bottom of a hill. And it was a little train, and it was a big hill, and in order to get to the top, the train had to say to itself, I think I can get to the top. I think I can get to the top of the hill. And the train repeated this phrase again, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And we know that the story ends with the train successfully climbing the hill. So the motivation and the idea behind the story is positive self-talk. You believe that you can do something and often that creates a positive mindset which helps you to accomplish your goals. So we have some students in our program who um, we all of our, the teachers in the ESL Center, they remember the students very fondly because they are very positive in their language learning. They invite conversation with others, even if they face a difficulty, they bounce back from that um, difficult situation, mistake, bad grade or problem, because they believe it is only a small problem in the bigger picture of their language learning. And as we know, learning a language is a lifelong process. As Keller mentioned, um, I spent, have spent many years in Germany, and I think my German is pretty good, but I know that I will have to learn for the rest of my life in order to really, really become proficient in the language. So the positive attitude can go a long way. So we would ask you to ask yourselves, do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in your ability to make progress? Are you mostly positive about your potential? So uh, from my experience, uh, I understand that English study can be very frustrating sometimes, especially when you are facing a difficult book or when you're facing a one of these hard tests like TOEFL or GRE or SAT. Uh, one thing I remind myself is I am from different country. I already mastered one language. This is the second language I'm trying to do. Another thing I always remember, even uh, people from the English language speaking country, they will, their English is all, might not be perfect too. So there might be people still making mistakes when they trying to write in essays or speaking English too. So you are not the only person who might make a mistake. And also, you, everybody in this room, you already have a language you're very good at, and this is second language you're trying to do, right? So think of somebody else from English-speaking country trying to learn your language, right? Yes. It's also gonna be taking them a long time to do that as well, too. And particularly, some language can be very hard for the other countries people to learn. Think about you master a harder language already. And when you say somebody is trying to speak your own mother tongue language, would you feel like you want to be a little bit more patient for that? That's a how English speaking country, like I can say that our faculty staff are very patient with students who are coming from different countries too. 
because we understand you're now coming from the English speaking country. So that will be the part, you know, you will feel like you're not going to be judged because of your English language speaking skills. I think that's great. That's great to add color. And I think it's important for students to remember too, when you call yourself an English language learner, it sounds like you're less than, but really what you're doing is you're becoming bilingual. You're becoming someone who speaks both languages, both your mother tongue and the language you're learning fluently. So that really is something to be proud of. Moving on to our fourth point, which says good language learners are intrinsically motivated to set their own goals. So I hope in this webinar, you are also learning some new vocabulary. <laughs> so good learners are intrinsically motivated and they set their own goals. So intrinsic motivation means the motivation that comes from inside of your own heart, your own brain. It's opposite of extrinsic motivation, which comes from outside of you. So students who are motivated by things outside of themselves might be learning English to please their parents, for a grade, to make the teacher happy, Students who are intrinsically motivated are learning English for themselves. They may want good grades or to please their parents, but they also want to improve themselves and they focus on the big picture. So in our intensive English program, we offer lots of extra opportunities to practice the language that are not part of grades or credit. For example, every week we have a coffee and conversation hour, and students go to that not because they get extra points, but they go because they want to engage with the language. They want to make new friendships, they want to practice what they've learned inside of the classroom, and really those students who are motivated by things outside of the specific people in the classroom do better. They learn more. They progress more quickly. So think about the big picture when you're learning English. Do you take opportunities to speak even though it's not connected to what you're doing directly? Are you motivated by the big picture of the fact that when you learn a language, you can make friendships and connect with people, that it's a lifelong skill that you will carry with you? All right, so as I promised, we have six qualities. Now we're moving on to number five. So for number five, again, it's pretty obvious, but don't forget that good language learners work with others. So language is a social activity. I don't know if we grew up alone and never meeting another person, we probably wouldn't need language. But of course, we grow up in community with others, and so language is a social game. We learn by speaking with others and listening. When we write, we write with an audience in mind. We pay attention to the way that other people use the language. So again, to give you an example from our ESL program, um, we spend a lot of time in class in discussion. One of the reasons is we want students to speak and share. We also want them to listen and learn from each other. And this is really typical of the American style of education at the college level. Um, even in uh, classes that are in your major, there is often a part of the class which involves discussion. And your professor will want you to express your opinion and listen to other people who are in your class. So the best language learners that I've had in my experience are the students who contribute, so they raise their hand and they offer their opinion or offer answers, but they also listen to each other. They're not just waiting for a turn so they can say something, they're actually listening to each other and using that again as an opportunity to share, to build relationships and to practice their English. So we have um, also conversation partners as part of our program, which means that we will pair students up with a native speaker of English, and once per week, they just talk about familiar topics to gain confidence, 
And again, reinforcing the idea that this social interaction is very beneficial. Mm -hmm. I want to agree with Debbie on this one, uh, especially if you think about the uh, English or any language, it's a social thing that it's a way you communicate your thoughts and it's a way you listen to others thought as well too. So think about before we starting going to school, everybody's already speaking in some sort of language. And it was because we use it every single day. We use it to communicate with our friends, with our family, with everybody that even when you're kids, you're trying to you know, like be able to come express yourself with those language. And that really helps with the learning the language by using it constantly and working with a group. Yeah. So one thing I think we can maybe like suggestion for students or for anybody who's learning different language is to find your partner, like somebody who you can study English together with. Uh, not just necessarily doing homework together mm -hmm. or go to class together, but the more so uh, you will be able to practice speaking at the same time practice the listening with each other and then you'll be able to be each other's uh, motivators support each other during this process and that is really helpful and in u.s class setting it is a very important skills to work with others as well too because a lot of classes a lot of classes i'm talking about in u.s you actually need to do teamwork group group project with your other classmates and that, that is important to be able to contribute yourself, to be able to show ability for team working. And it is also going to be a great way to improve your language skills during this process as well. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And I think um, one of the other ways that students find that they both practice the language and build relationships is with student organizations. We have a lot of student organizations according to the student's major, according to the student's hobby and interest. So really, it's up to the individual person. How much interaction do you want? You can have it from morning until night, mm -hmm. um, but really students have to feel that they're looking for these opportunities and they're out there. So we would invite you, even where you are, um, you know, I don't think any of you here are here at Kent State right now or yet, but where you are, do you take the opportunity to engage with English language learning with other people? You know, we're, we're lucky now to live in this age and time of technology when you can go online and you can um, virtually using your phones. There are lots of ways that you can engage with other people and get that same benefit. So this is our last point um, that we're going to talk with you about, and then we're going to share some resources, as, and as Color mentioned, um, we'll have some chance for question and answers. But um, the last quality of good language learners that we'd like to mention today is that good language learners learn from their mistakes. So the mistakes that one person makes might be different from the mistakes that another person makes. And that self-awareness figuring out which mistakes do I make is an important quality that good language learners have. So for example, um, in our program and in lots of other programs, we have students write drafts of their essays. So instead of just writing something and giving it to the teacher and getting a grade, students will write a rough draft, a first draft, which they will give to the teacher and they get some feedback. They notice their mistakes, and then they have to write a second draft. And sometimes your teacher will ask you to write a third draft. And part of the reason is that we believe students benefit by making mistakes, noticing their mistakes, and then hopefully correcting them and not repeating them again. Some students might keep a notebook. These are the really, really good language learners in my opinion. They might keep a personal notebook where every time they have difficulty communicating, they mispronounce a word like sneakers or snickers, they make note of it in their notebook, or I'm sure there are some electronic ways you can do it these days. And that self-awareness about your mistake making can really benefit you. I think one of the um, reasons that this is also um, a, a good thing to mention here in Ohio is 
Ohio is located in the Midwest of the United States. And um, we're not famous for many things, but one of the things I think the Midwest is known for is friendliness. The people are pretty friendly and pretty open. So you can feel like when you make mistakes, um, people are going to be kind, I hope, about the way that they help you to correct your mistakes. Some of our students live with American roommates and they'll ask their American roommate, every time I make a mistake, please tell me so that I can learn from them. And again, this is a safe and beneficial way to learn from those mistakes. I want to say mistake is probably the, one of our best friends yes. during language learning. And take it, uh, don't take it as a, a bad thing. Think of it as a, a good opportunity, a good chance to improve yourself. Because if we don't ever make mistakes, we'll never know what's the right way to do it, right? So it's all teachers to us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I think that's a really good way of saying it. Mistakes are our friends. So again, we would ask you to reflect to yourself. Do you learn from your mistakes? Can you begin to notice the specific mistakes that you make so that you can correct them and build from there? That's a lot of really good reflection questions yes. over here. <laughs> good. So kind of to summarize here, we've talked about these six qualities of language learners. And um, to give it in brief, we would recommend that you be brave that you take risks, that you believe in yourself, that you set your own goals, that you learn with others, and finally, that you learn from your mistakes. I wonder if you think you will be able to use any of these suggestions today. And I'd ask you to remember that it's all a balance. You don't want to always take risks. You don't want to focus completely on your mistakes. It's a balance. It's about making some adjustments so that you can maximize the learning and the progress you make with the language and really with a lot of other, uh, a lot of other things that you do in your life. So um, I'd like to just mention a few of our favorite resources. So um, here at the ESL Center, we've got um, a lot of uh, faculty who um, are constantly sharing ideas with me and with their students about different resources. And as I mentioned before, aren't we lucky to live in a time when there is so much available um, through the web to uh, people all the time, new resources are constantly being added. So these are a few of the ones I'd like to mention to you. Perhaps you've heard of them, perhaps some of them are new. Um, in the left-hand column, uh, I have some reading and listening resources for you. Um, NPR and BBC are just straight up news sources. NPR is the US-based one and BBC, of course, from the UK. Um, an excellent way to improve your listening is by tuning into the news. Um, I know a lot of students really don't like listening to the news, Sometimes I don't like listening to the news either because it's not always very happy. It's excellent listening practice. Um, in addition to those in the left-hand column, eslbits.net is a great website. I think it's a little bit of a hidden treasure. It's got a lot of um, audio books and short talks which have both the audio and the transcript so that you can read along as you listen. And the rest in that column also follow in that same idea. I would recommend that you add 20 to 30 minutes of listening and reading time to whatever you're doing every day. It's about that intrinsic motivation again. If you're waiting for your teacher to tell you this is what you must do, that will be a limitation. If you go out and you listen just for the benefit of listening and learning, I think it's going to help you out. In the middle column, I have some uh, resources, Quizlet and Kahoot. Um, both of those are um, tools that you can use to make your own um, little flashcards for practice or games. But a lot of teachers have already created Quizlets and Kahoots, which you can use then for good practice. 
And on the right, we have some resources which combine skills. On Duolingo, you may have on your phone. It's kind of a quick and fun way to practice with the language. And ESL Gold and manythings.org mix um, a lot of the reading, writing, listening um, type resources together. Thank you, Debbie. Those are really good resources. If you haven't taken a screenshot, making sure you do that. But we are probably also going to send everybody the re recording over the presentation as well, too. So you can uh, go back to look at it. Or if you want to share with your friend, that's fine, too. So um, I'd like to um, just give you a little bit of information about our program. I've mentioned it a few times. Um, we are the ESL Center of Kent State University. We're an intensive English program and we focus on English for academic purposes. Uh, we've been helping students with language learning for more than 25 years now. Um, we offer what we hope students find a, as a warm and welcoming first place where they can both build their language skills and learn about the American classroom. So it's a safe space to practice in and um, acclimate, get used to American culture and the American academic setting. Um, it's not just something we believe. Um, by tracking uh, our students after they leave ESL and begin their academic programs, we know that their GPAs are actually better in their academic classes after they've gone through ESL than if they had just come through um, a direct admission through a TOEFL or an IELTS score, for example. So all of our faculty have a minimum of a master's degree in TESOL, many years of experience, so we do our very best to keep students engaged. We ask them to work hard, but we do our best to make, uh, help them make the progress that they want to as quickly as possible. If you'd like more information about the ESL Center, I have our website across the top of this um, slide. And at the bottom is my um, direct and pers uh, not personal, but professional email address. Feel free to email me. Um, I'm always interested to uh, you know, communicate with students by email. If there are any questions I can answer, I'd be very happy to do that. And here's a little bit more information about Kent State. I thought you might be interested knowing uh, we're located in the Northeast Ohio. It will be able to see this little picture over here. So we have, uh, so unlike a lot of college town, we're actually very close to big cities nearby us. So here's a Pittsburgh that is about an hour and a half drive from Kent State. Columbus, which is the capital city of Ohio State, it's uh, about two hours drive. And then there is also Cleveland, about an hour, and Akron is about 30 minutes. So we are actually right in the heart of uh, many big cities around us. So this gives the students a lot of ability to go explore the world and go find internship and go find a job later. And uh, we uh, can say we have uh, over 280 programs, undergraduate programs, including grad one, we have over 380 programs on campus. So there's a lot of majors. So a lot of majors, if you can think of, we probably have it. And some of our highlight majors, including we have our own airport. So we have our aeronautic programs, aeronautic engineering, flight technology, if you want to be a pilot sometime. And then <laughs> we also have a very good fashion program, which is ranked number four in the US for fashion design. And fashion merchandising is ranked number three. For the global, it's ranked number 17. So it's a very highly ranked program. We also have some really good programs, including architecture, which is located in the, this building. On the top right, it's a very beautiful building being featured by the New York Times before. And we also have a very good business program, which is AACSB credit. A uh, good journalism program, and if you're using this screen, and uh, you're probably using the Liquid Crystal screen right now when you're mm -hmm. looking at this presentation, the Liquid Crystal technology, uh, you know, you have on your mobile, have your computer, have your TV. It's actually Kent State invention. We actually first place for Kent State. Uh, sorry, we actually first place for the Liquid Crystal technology. Until today, we're still leading the Liquid Technology research worldwide. Yes, great information. And uh, you can see in the little picture there that we're a tree, um, a tree campus USA, which means our campus is just beautifully green and full of natural life. Um, right now in the springtime, the flowers are out on the trees it's and things beautiful. are starting to green up. So mm -hmm. uh, 
great university for quality programs, but also a beautiful place to study. Yeah, we are located in the north of Great Lake area, though, so we do snow a lot in yeah. winter, just letting you know. <laughs> but it's fun. I like the snow. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Students will go out to sliding. They will do like all the fun things in the winter time, and winter is beautiful as well, too, especially for the people who come from the south part, uh, having to say the winter yet. Be br embrace yourself if you're coming to Kent State one day. <laughs> And then we also offer a lot of scholarship for our undergrad freshmen, 80% of students will receive scholarship as well from Kent State, including students who are starting with ESL too. Okay, so I think that's all the information we are providing today. So if you have questions, I invite you to unmute yourself to talk to us. We like the uh, conversation. And if you want to ask me questions over in the chat box, feel free to do that as well too. We'll have a little bit of Q and A session. It looks like somebody answered the question about their own personality, outgoing, confident, like to work with a team, oh. generally very optimistic. Awesome, good to see. I've never seen that. <laughs> Any other, any questions you guys might have? I'm trying to look into see if there's any questions here. It's really um, a nice opportunity to connect with people all over the world. This has been um, you know, a pleasure to connect with you and we hope that if you found it helpful or useful that we can um, find an opportunity again in the future to share some topics. We're looking to see if anyone has any questions or comments that they want to share with us. Maybe some of your own ideas and suggestions in addition to the ones that we have shared with you. <laughs> How difficult is it to learn Chinese? <laughs> uh, it's as difficult as, <laughs> as, as uh, English. <laughs> and Mike said, thank you for sharing great advice. Thank you for participating. Mm -hmm. I am actually curious about, so among our 23 participants right now, we had a higher number earlier. I think some people left already. So where do you guys come from? Mm -hmm. Can you type your country over here in the chat box so we can learn a little bit more about it yourself? I see a question there. I see China. How can I make high school students interested in English learning? So that's a good question. I think one of the best ways to keep students interested in English learning is to keep it real, to keep it relevant as much as you can. As I mentioned before, um, through the internet, we have so many very good resources that are not just for language learning, but they're about learning about the culture, about pop culture. I would encourage you to um, inside the classroom and maybe as homework assignments outside of the classroom, invite students to explore, invite them to practice their reading skills and their listening skills um, with content that's available. As Keller mentioned, we can share with you um, the links that we had on those resources, but that would be my suggestion. Frank, are you a teacher for high school? Just curious. I know there's uh, quite a few Chinese participants over <laughs> here. Hula. <laughs> nice. Yep, he says he's an English teacher in China. Very good. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to, I don't know how large your size, uh, the size of your class is, Frank, too, that if you can break students into smaller groups and get them to lead discussion, to maybe even prepare a lesson, you know, kind of flipping the roles a little bit can be a good way to engage students too. English vocabulary is a big problem for my students. Yeah. What's the best way to build English vocabulary? I believe that the best way to build English vocabulary is to use the vocabulary. So we, they say that you need to interact with a word eight, 10, 15 times before you really memorize it. So just memorizing it for the purpose of a quiz or a test, you might forget it again the next week. 
But if you make an effort to practice saying the word, to listen for the word, to notice, then I think that that's going to build your vocabulary. Practice, practice, practice. That's always the, that's always the best advice. And Teach. Mm -hmm. Mike asks, any suggestions on teaching science in English to ESL students? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's become a, a growing field now is um, teaching content um, through English. Um, and I imagine that there are some excellent resources um, out there. And I'd be happy, Mike, to follow up with you um, with some specific ideas. Um, off the top of my head, um, I'm thinking that um, uh, the not well NPR actually if you go to the NPR website um, you can search there for specific areas so you could look for science but also PBS the public broadcasting system in the United States has excellent quality um, videos documentaries about nature and other science topics and the other area I would look is PBS kids um, the, the website that's for kids specifically They've got a lot of children's programming that integrates science, um, and I think that might be a good place. So Frank said, high school students are so busy to learn other more important subjects. They only have about less than an hour to learn English. That's tough. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's less than an hour to learn English. So, you know, I think to the, the greatest extent that you can make a little bit of that time fun and engaging, I think that's helpful. But yeah, that's tough to have such a short amount of time. I would think if students are commuting um, back and forth to school, you know, maybe they're taking a, a train or a bus. Um, could they tune into a podcast so they get that extra listening experience? Could they be using their phones to engage with English language materials? That might be a way to squeeze in a little bit of extra time. Yeah, and if they don't use their vocabulary often, I feel like they're probably forgetting about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So like, I feel like the language is a repetition. A lot of times you just had to repeating using that. If yeah. I've been saying the same question five times or 10 times, I probably gonna do a better job with the times we so uh -huh. I think that, you know, with the vocabulary too, um, try to get away from translation. So here's the word in Chinese and here's the word in English. I memorized English, Chinese, English, Chinese. What else can you do to make that word memorable? Can you practice pronouncing it? Can you connect it to an image? Can you put it into the context of a sentence? Can you find synonyms and antonyms, opposites and similar words? So anything you can do to develop more interest in individual words, I think will help you to hold on to them for longer. Yeah, and uh, for us over here. So I'm also working with our Chinese department. I don't teach English, but I do help in teaching Chinese. So the way we teach a different language, we call it immersing language teaching. So for students, they actually have to listen. You're not using uh, English to teach Chinese. You're actually using Chinese to teach Chinese. Mm -hmm. So here for ESL, same thing too. They use English to teach English. Mm -hmm. So for students, they will be exposed to English speaking and listening all the time. And in this way, I think it's actually better to help them to uh, getting that familiarized the ways, uh, getting familiarized the ways the language environment. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. I would agree completely. Yeah, that's the, uh, so on the one hand, it's wonderful that we have technology. And on the other hand, Google Translate really is a, a big challenge in similar programs that students feel it's a little bit of that ambiguity point that I made before. When you have the translation device, then you feel like you know for 100% sure what the English to Chinese translation is. Um, but students have to break the habit of using those translation devices mm -hmm. and begin to think in the language, use the language, and not rely on going back and forth. That's a tough habit to break. Yeah. And yeah, mm -hmm, sorry. Yeah, so I think, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I was looking at Frank's <laughs> comment with puzzling. You're right. Sometimes students will take complex thoughts in their native language and they put it through a translator 
and the meaning is very, very different when it's used through the translator. So again, it's for individual words, it's fine, but for complex thoughts, translators often don't work. So Mike is asking, besides reading in context, what are other ways to increase a student's vocabulary? Hmm. I want to say it's actually more than just reading. I feel like speaking for me is a better way to increase my vocabulary, like by listening and speak, repeating it. Mm -hmm. uh, like we actually, like ESL, we actually have a quite different few classes. I think every class is introducing new vocabulary right. as well too, right? right? Yeah. I think that also, um, if it's a, a static relationship with a book where you're looking at a chapter and here's the vocabulary, um, it will never become dynamic or changing. If you can find ways to interact with people, that's where the vocabulary starts to get a little more dynamic. Um, so again, the opportunity to practice using um, the language with others can help with vocabulary. Yes, and um, really students just have to spend time with the language it's it's you know about yeah. the best way i gave a uh, my example from recent so i had a hard time remember how to say reincarnation hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's funny like it's not like why, why am i even bringing this at work so <laughs> i also is a reincarnation or incarnation i never able to say the right and until uh during easter Recently, so we had an Easter event. We were, um, I went to, I was visiting church, I was listening to stories about it. And then from that day moving on, I was able to remember reincarnation because, like, I had to listen to this multiple times, I had to speak to it. Then that helped me. Another issue I had before was uh, between destiny and destination. Mm. So I always tell people, oh, we are reached to our destiny, but then I'll get corrected and say it's actually destination. <laughs> That's nice. So even though, you know, it's, yeah. it's just is something, so you use it multiple times and you're like, okay, so I made enough mistake about it. I'm going to learn from this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I go back to what, yeah. like, the number six point that we mentioned earlier. So yeah. when you're making mistake, it's actually helping to reinforce the memory too. Yeah. So I know I remember, okay, we reached a destination. <laughs> we did not reach a destination. <laughs> Mike, I would um, recommend to Quizlet is um, that one of those resources. So teachers can easily create Quizlets for their students, which are basically like flashcards. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could kind of make it into a game. If you've never played Kahoot before with your students, that's another really fun, dynamic, free resource you can use um, for the students to drill either in class or on their own. So sometimes, you know, trying to make a game out of it can be a way of increasing vocabulary too. Great. Frank said, I used to teach Chinese in US, so I know how difficult for US students to learn Chinese as well. Yes. <laughs> it is, it is a difficult, but they're a great students. Yes. You know, they're, they like to try to speak as much as possible yes. with a different language, and they will make sentences, they will write stories about it too. They might not be perfect, but uh, it's uh, that, you know, like willingness to do it yes. are really going to help them to success. I think the same for our Chinese students as well, too. Yeah. I'm a Chinese citizen, by the way. <laughs> you probably guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I really have to say, I admire all of our students who work very hard to learn the language. It's really very impressive. And all of the English uh, teachers out there and all of the Chinese language teachers out there, mm -hmm. it's you know certainly a, a, a very um, important, um, but not an easy job that you're doing. Yeah. So we actually use Quizlet in our set. Oh, oh good, nice. that's helpful. Yeah, Kahoot is also really good mm -hmm. too. We use it with our students' events all the time too, so they will, guessing the uh the right answer yeah. then the winner will get a, like a, a word later too yeah good quite helpful it's a helpful it's fun it's yes. engaging i think it's keep people's attention like yes. focus on the screen for like a minute i'm going to say um for science at the elementary level That's nice. So I think we are reaching to the time. 
at this moment. Uh, if there is no further questions, we're gonna go ahead and uh, stop recording and close up the presentation. And I do want to let you know, moving forward, we will have more presentations in the future uh, that is knowledge-based. So we had something about uh, uh, networking before. We, th this month we're doing the ESL Center. We also have architecture uh, in line. We will talk about architecture programs and hopefully we'll be able to invite Debbie back for more ESL sessions for students. Um, we have one more question. Do you like the suggestion for ESL teacher? Do you have any suggestion for Yale as teacher to collaborate with other subject teachers? Hmm. Um, and so I wonder if that's in, um, I think, Mike, are you in China right now? So I don't know if you belong to um, international um, TESOL. Um, it's an, you know the um, main organization for teachers of English as, as a second or foreign language and for students. So I would invite you to look at maybe um, the international TESOL network that is near you. Um, that might be a chance for you to connect virtually. Yeah, collaboration is, is an art form, right? It's, uh, it's not easy to do, but it's very beneficial, of course, in supporting the students all around. Yep. All right, thank you everybody for uh, coming to the session. And uh, we will send, <laughs> you're welcome. We will send uh, uh, the recording to everybody, uh, hopefully this week or, or maybe next week, depends on how soon we can get a video edited. And uh, um, again, I would like you to keep eye on, on the future sessions we were having. And uh, thank you again for participating. And uh, uh, hopefully you learn a little bit more about English and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, uh, Kent State as well too, and also our great ESL program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Color. Thank you, everybody.